Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name's Will Noel. I'm the director of the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts here at Penn Libraries. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight Dot Porter, uh, my co-instructor on the current RBS course, The Medieval Manuscript in the 21st Century, and curator of digital research services at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, where she participates in a wide-ranging humanities research and development team within the context of a special collections department. Her projects focus on the digitization and visualization of medieval manuscripts. Dot holds master's degrees in medieval studies and library science and started her career working on image-based digital editions of medieval manuscripts. She has worked on a variety of digital humanities projects over a decade long career, focusing on materials as diverse as ancient texts and Russian religious folklore providing both technical support and scholarly expertise. From 2010 to March 2013, she was the Associate Director for Digital Library Content and Services at the Indiana University Bloomington Libraries, where she led in planning and implementing new services to support librarians and faculty in the creation of digital projects. She has also worked for the Digital Humanities Observatory at the Royal Irish Academy and the Collaboratory for Research in Computing for Humanities at the University of Kentucky. Dot's presentation tonight is entitled, Is This Your Book? What Digitization Does to Manuscripts and What We Can Do <laughs> Think About It. <laughs> Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dot Porter. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Is this, is this good? All right. Um, so I want to thank everybody uh, for coming um, this afternoon to my talk, and I want to thank especially the Rare Book School for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, before I start, I want to say that this is a little bit um, less practical than um, what I normally talk about, so I hope that this, um, this works. I hope you all enjoy my talk. So um, the title of my talk, uh, the, the title of the talk that I originally proposed is, Is This Your Book? what digitization does to manuscripts and what we can do about it. Um, but as I was sort of working on what I, exactly I was going to be talking about, I realized that um, I'm not entirely sure if there's anything we can do about what digitization does to manuscripts. And I want to be clear, I'm not talking about what it does physically to manuscripts, but what it does to sort of our conceptualization of manuscripts. Um, but we can think about it. Um, and so that's what I want to do a bit today. I want us to think about digitized books specifically about digitized medieval manuscripts, since that's what I'm interested in. So that's really what I can talk to um, the most. So like any self-respecting book, book history scholar, I'm going to start our discussion of digitized manuscripts by talking about memes. The word meme was coined in 1976 by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene. In the Oxford English Dictionary, meme is defined as a cultural element or behavioral trait whose transmission and consequent persistence in a population, although occurring by non-genetic means, especially imitation, is considered as analogous to the inheritance of a gene. Dawkins was looking for a term to describe something that has existed for millennia, as long as humans have existed. And the examples he gave include things like tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes fashions, ways of making pots, and building arches. These are all things that are picked up by a community Ideas and concepts that move among members of that community are imitated and modified, and which are frequently then moved on to new communities, as well as where the process of imitation and modification continues. More recently, the term meme has been applied specifically to images or texts shared, often with modification on the internet, particularly through social media. If you've ever been rickrolled, you have been on the receiving end of a particularly popular and virulent meme. You all know what Rickrolling is? No. You don't know what Rickrolling is? I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you later. Um, <laughs> I should have included it in my, in my, in my talk. So, so uh, this is all very interesting, Dot, I hear you say. But what do memes have to do with digitized manuscripts? This is an excellent question. What I want to do now is look at a couple of specific examples of memes and think a bit in detail about how they work and what it looks like to push the same idea through memes that are similar but have slightly different connotations. Then I want to look at some different terms that scholars have used to refer to digitized manuscripts 
and think a bit about how those terms influence the way we think about digitized manuscripts again. So we use a term, it influences the way we think, and then it goes back, it's like a, a cycle, if, if, if they do that. My proposition is that these terms, while they may not exactly be memes, function like memes in the way that they are adapted and used within the library and medieval studies scholarly communities. So let's see how this goes. In the film The Black Panther, which was released back in February of this year, there's a scene where a character has come to the country of Wakanda to challenge the king for the throne. This character, Njadaka, better known by his nickname Killmonger, is a cousin of the king, T'Challa, but was unknown to pretty much everyone in Wakanda until just before he arrives to make his challenge. At the climax of this scene, during which Killmonger and T'Challa fight hand-to-hand -hand combat in six inches of water, Killmonger, who is clearly winning, turns to the small audience of Wakandans gathered to witness the battle and exclaims, is this your king? If you haven't seen the film, I'm about to spoil it for you. Uh, it turns out the answer to this question is no. In fact, Killmonger is the king. This is a phrase that was born to be a meme, and within a month, that's exactly what happened. According to the Know Your Meme website, the first instance of the Is This Your King meme appeared on March 20th on Twitter when at They Want Nolan tweeted a screenshot of the scene with the caption, Is This Your Spring? If you think back to March, the weather was pretty terrible pretty much everywhere in the country. It was long and tedious, and it went back and forth between snow, and then it would get warm again, and then it would snow again. So is this your spring? Well, no, it's not. This type of meme is a snow clone, defined as a type of phrasal template in which, in which certain words may re be replaced with another to produce new variations with altered meanings, similar to the fill-in-the-blank game of Mad Libs. I would like to note here that this term, snow clone, was coined in 2004 by American linguists Jeffrey K. Pullum and Glenn Whitman, specifically to describe this phenomenon. Now, the concept of a snow clone has been around for much longer than the term, Think of, I'm not an ex, but I play one on TV, which was the most hilarious phrase when I was a kid. And the, is this your king meme works the same way, where we replace king with some other word to make a phrase that is understood to elicit a negative response. Here are some other examples of this meme featured on, on its Know Your Meme page. So these all supply the identity of the person asking the question. They vary widely by topic. And one of them, this one down in the far left corner, um, makes a slight modification to the image. Um, but the one thing that they all have in common is that they imply this negative response to the question. I made one myself. <laughs> my meme features a screenshot of my favorite manuscript, LJS 101, as seen through the pen in hand manuscript interface. In my meme, the question asked is, is this your book? As we know from the context of the original meme, the answer to the question is no, this is not my book. I've made a few other memes, and for some reason, most of them play with the relationship that the digitized version of a manuscript has with a physical object. I have no idea why that could be. Um, <laughs> memes such as, is this your king? And this next one, which is the, this is a pigeon meme, um, enable us, which enable us to ask questions with assumed answers, work well for my meme needs. Though I find the differences between the emotions that these two memes are designed to elicit fascinating. In this meme, the original scene is from an anime where a human-like android sees a butterfly and asks, is this a pigeon? This is another snow clone where the question asker, the object of the question and the question itself can be replaced with almost literally anything else. As before, I've replaced the object of the question with digital images of LJS 101 and specifically identified myself as the question asker. As with the previous meme, we know the answer to the question posed is no, although the context is different. While the king meme is used to express aggressive negativity, the pigeon meme is used to express mild but total confusion. The same idea can be pushed through both memes. Is this digital thing a manuscript? And while the answer is the same, no it's not, the negative response of the pigeon meme is more like, oh you silly thing, thinking that digitized manuscript is the same as the manuscript. Well, the negative response of the king meme is, that thing is not the same as the manuscript, I'm offended you think so, and I'm gonna throw it out the window so you don't try that again. 
Although both of these memes can be used as a kind of mirror for us to view the relationship between a manuscript and its digitized version, they expect different responses and elicit different emotions, much as different words used to refer to the same situation or person might invoke different emotions. The memes are, in effect, acting as a kind of terminology. So now I want to pivot and talk about how terminology might act as memes. I would like to take it as a given that how we talk about things influences how we think about them. Therefore, the terms we use to describe things matter. Therefore, the terms that we choose to refer to digitized manuscripts matter, not as much as the terms we use to describe other people, but they do matter. I would also like to reiterate the proposition I made a few minutes ago that our terminology, while perhaps not memes themselves, are meme-like. In his 2016 article, Utlege, Sir John Mandeville's audience and the three late medieval English travelers to Italy and Jerusalem, Anthony Bale discusses Jerusalem as a meme in medieval English travel writings, but I find that his description of meme fits well with what I would like to do here with terminology. He says, quote, the meme proposes a model of cultural transmission based on audiences ongoing use and appropriation of the source, as opposed to the scholarly desire to return to the source as the best or original iteration. For a term, this would mean, then this is me talking, so for a term, this would mean common usage points not to the original meaning of the word, but to the word as it is actually being used. That's a bit of a circular argument, but I, I hope it makes sense. Um, Bale continues, Memes have not one stable author, no unitary point of origins, and are not retrospective, but rather change with their audiences, causing people to do things, stimulating actions and changing behaviors, leading people to take a particular route, see a particular site, notice one thing but not another, find new meanings in an old source. And I think of terms like this. So they begin with a specific meaning. So you could go to the OED and see what earlier meanings of a term were. But then a scholar adopts one because we need some way to describe this new thing that we've created. So we appropriate this term with its existing meaning and we use it to describe our new thing. The new thing takes on the old meaning of the term, but the term itself becomes imbued with meaning from what we are now using it to describe. The next time someone uses that term, it carries along with it this new, this new meaning. Some scholars take time to define their terms, but some scholars choose not to instead depending on their audience to recognize the existing definitions and connotations of the terms they use. Um, and now I'm going to talk specifically about people talking about digitized manuscripts. For example, in her 2013 article, Fleshing Out the Text, The Transcendent Manuscript in the Digital Age, Elaine Treharn, coming out of a description of how medieval people would have always interacted with a physical book, says, quote, for the greater proportion of a modern audience on any given day, one has necessarily to rely on the digital replication, the world of the ironically disembodied and defleshed simulacrum avatar surrogate. Here Traharn uses the terms simulacrum avatar and surrogate without defining them, and she groups them together in that order, placing simulacrum first in that list. More than the other two, simulacrum has a negative connotation, as we can see from its entry in the OED, a simulacrum is a mere image. It looks like a thing without possessing its substance or proper qualities. It is a specious imitation. Although it is near identical in meaning and from uh, related Latin roots as the term facsimile, which I'll discuss in a moment, facsimile lacks the negative connotations that simulacrum has. Although the terms are, are undefined by the author, I do think this was a purposeful word choice intended to elicit negative feeling. Compare this with Bill Endress, who in his 2012 article, More Than Meets the Eye, Going 3D with an Early Medieval Manuscript, spends several paragraphs defining his terms and arguing for why he chooses to use some terms and not others. I'm going to be quoting Endress a lot in this, art, in this paper because it's really interesting what he does. Endress says, quote, I will refer to 2D and 3D images as digital artifacts or digital versions although not totally satisfied with either term as it relates to epistemology. I am tempted to refer to them as digital offspring, the results of a marriage between digital and manuscript technologies, with digital versions having unique qualities and a life of their own. This term is problematic, but it speaks to the excesses, commonalities, and deficits when digital versions are measured against their physical antecedent. Andrus then discusses some other terms, including two of the ones I will consider in a moment, so we'll return to his thoughts later. 
The point here is that Endress defines his terms and explains why he's using them, while Treherne relies on us to understand her meaning through the known definition of the terms. For each term, I will discuss the pre-digital definitions of the term using the historical thesaurus of English as the source. The THE also provides timelines illustrating the temporality of different terms that fall under the same heading, and I wish that we had time to look at those timelines for the definitions of terms that seem to fall um, closest to the intended meaning when the term is applied to digitized manuscripts. Um, so the, the timeline, there's sort of a heading, and there's lots of different terms, and you can see when terms that mean approximately the same thing were being used. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to see we, we use this term, but we don't use this other term that was used to mean the same thing at the same time. Why would we do that? Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to do that today, um, but if there's interest, we could talk about that uh, later. I'm also going to include a few quotes where scholars refer to digitized manuscripts using that term, although these quotes are meant to be representative and not exhaustive. Um, that is, I couldn't tell you the first time that any particular term was used to refer uh, to a digitized manuscript, but I can give you an impression of how the term has been used or is being used currently. So let's begin with the term facsimile, which we've all heard. Facsimile is from the Latin, literally meaning make similar. The earliest attestation of the term is from 1661. This is, of course, according to this dictionary. There might be earlier ones we don't uh, know about. Um, and this refers to a transcribed copy of a text not necessarily something that looks like the text being copied from. So we know it's the same text, but it might not actually look like it. That's what the similarity <coughs> means. About 30 years later, the same term is being used to mean an exact copy or likeness, an exact counterpart or representation. By 1801, it's being used in a more generalized way to refer to a not exact representation. Uh, per David McKittrick, it's also around this time that photographic print facsimiles of manuscripts under the scholarly landscape in larger numbers. By the late 19th century, it's been adopted, adapted to refer to the communication of images through radio, wire, or similar methods, the modern day fax machine, for example. This meaning maintains the previous definitions focusing on a facsimile as a kind of copy, but adds the meaning of communicating over distance. And I expect these combined uses of the terms, the ones with the, with the blue arrows, um, <coughs> print facsimiles plus the sharing of images over distance, or why digital facsimile became an obvious term to use to describe these new old objects. The use of facsimile to refer to textual materials clearly varies over time and from individual to individual. Um, and the question of what is similar is not always clear. In his 1926 article, Facsimile Reprints of Old Books, A.W. Pollard seems to use the term according to its 1661 attestation, not according to its 1691 attestation. He says, quote, it is intended to cover any reprint the form of which has been influenced to any considerable extent by the form of the edition reproduced. Pollard's facsimile reprints include, quote, one, photographic facsimiles, two, type facsimiles, i.e. editions in which types of similar founts to be those used in the original are set to follow the original setting as closely as possible, three, more or less luxurious reprints which seek to reproduce the general effect of the original with such concessions to modern usage as the producer may think desirable. Facsimile or digital facsimile has been, for as long as I can remember, the default term that libraries use to refer to their own digital copies and that scholars use to refer to the digital images they incorporate into their online projects. In November 1993, Kevin Kiernan gave the pres a presentation, a, a symposium of the Association of Research Libraries, in which he said that the electronic Beowulf, quote, will in its first manifestation make available in early 1994 a full color electronic facsimile of Cotton Vitalius A15 to readers in the British Library and at other selected sites. He continues later on, quote, as this electronic archive grows, it will incorporate facsimiles of many other documents that help us restore parts of the manuscript that were lost or damaged by fire in the early 18th century. Kiernan is referring not only to straightforward digital images, but also to images taken under ultraviolet light that were included in the edition. As he says later in the presentation, because of the UV images, quote, readers of the electronic facsimile will thus acquire a reproduction of the manuscript that reveals more than the manuscript itself does under ordinary circumstances. 
The use of the term facsimile also makes it possible for scholars to consider how digital facsimiles relate to older ways of making similar. In her discussion of the restoration of manuscripts by Matthew Parker in his circle, which she interprets as a kind of facsimile, Sean Eckerd says, quote, today digital technologies continue to recreate medieval books for a variety of audiences, and the digital facsimiles, like the hand and machine produced examples, both reproduce and relocate their medieval objects. But our current attitudes toward facsimile differ from Parker's and Dibden's, and may in fact inhibit our ability to see the extent to which we too are recreating medieval text objects according to our own tastes. As technology has enabled ever more exact reproduction, the cheerful refashioning proposed by Parker has been replaced by an emphasis on the photographic, on the exact, with at times an accompanying confidence that perfect reproduction can approach the revelation of an object's truth. So these people are all using this term facsimile, digital facsimile, electronic facsimile, and they're kind of meaning different things, um, but sort of the same thing too in that same term. Surrogate. The term surrogate is interesting because um, unlike facsimile, which is a fairly straightforward synonym for a copy, the term refers to something standing in for or perhaps even replacing something else. It was first used in the 16th century to describe the act of appointing someone as a delegate or a substitute. In the 17th century, the term is adopted to be a noun, to refer to the person who is being thus delegated. Other uses of the term, meaning more or less similar things, are attested through the 17th century. Until 1644, we have a general meaning substitute. So this is the most general meaning we get um, there. Now, since the 1970s, the term has been used in a more intimate way to refer to sexual surrogates and surrogate mothers. As my colleague Bridget Werty pointed out to me while we were discussing the term surrogate, the term is al almost always used to describe bodies, either a person having power delegated to them or a body acting as a substitute for another body. So the implication is that using this term to refer to digitized manuscripts doesn't only mean that digital is standing in for the physical, but it also, by virtue of the previous uses of the term, may imply some sort of embodiment or materiality of the digital object that is acting as the surrogate. Paul Conway has an extensive discussion of the digital surrogate in his 2014 article, Digital Transformations and the Archival Nature of Surrogates. And although he is referring to archival materials and not to medieval manuscripts specifically, I would expect that the use of the term comes from the same place, so I will quote him here. He reflects my own thoughts about a surrogate being more than a copy, saying, quote, the creation of digital surrogates from archival sources is fundamentally a process of representation, far more interesting and complex than merely copying from one medium to another. Theories of representation and the vast literature derived from them are at the heart of many disciplines scholarship and of particular relevance for scholars who work primarily or exclusively in the digital domain. He then continues to cite several other scholars who discuss the relationship digital copies continue to have with their sources well after they have been created, even as they those digital objects themselves have their own materialities. Bill Endress, who I quoted above, continues his thoughtfulness in the same piece as he considers surrogate as a term for his own use in describing 3D images of manuscripts. He says, quote, a term that has gained some commonality in 3D is digital surrogate. Bernard Fisher uses the term for 3D renderings of archaeological sites, like the impressive Rome Reborn. Fisher's interest in 3D is to construct digital cityscapes and large spaces, thus his use of surrogate, the virtual environment functioning as a substitute or proxy, a stand-in for the like of a dig site, or what once was, like ancient Rome, as a means to generate and test hypotheses, fulfilling a specific epistemic function. Surrogate fits Fisher's needs, but does not speak as readily to the full range of epistemic considerations that I want to explore for a manuscript, particularly the excesses of a digital artifact that add to our knowledge in other ways and its effect on looking and knowing. The excesses that Endress is referring to here are things like special lighting and the affordances of 3D imaging, and he feels that the term surrogate isn't sufficient to include these things, although Endress's um, excesses are very similar to those things that Kiernan was thinking of in 1993 when he used the term electronic facsimile. However, Kiernan did not use the term surrogate in 1993. 
It would be interesting to see when the term surrogate was first used to refer to digital objects and if it would have been available to Kiernan even in 93 or if that was just facsimile was what you called them. The third term, avatar, is relatively new to me. Uh, not the term, but this usage of the term. Although Sean Eckerd used it in the coda to her, 19, or her, sorry, her 2008 book, Printing in the Middle Ages, the name of the chapter being Coda, Ghost and the Machine, Digital Avatars of Medieval Manuscripts, which I think we should all admit is a pretty fantastic chapter title. Um, I also think it may be the first use of the term avatar to refer to digitized manuscripts, although I'm not completely positive about that. The term has, has been picked up a bit. It was used by classicist Seglione Tart in her 2011 presentation interpreting ancient documents of avatars, uncertainty, and knowledge creation, and is also mentioned by Endress and, um, in the, his piece, and very recently by Michelle Warren in a just published article, Remix the Medieval Manuscript Experiments with Digital Infrastructure. And I should mention, actually, Michelle Warren was a student in our class a couple of years ago, and she just got a couple of great big awards for this book she's writing, which is exciting. So the term is not yet common, but it might be gaining purchase because of its sort of inherent complexity and interesting um, background. So I really like Avatar because of the connotations brought along with its original definition. According to Hindu mythology, an avatar is the incarnate human manifestation of a deity. It is thus the avatar that is embodied this can be contrasted with the term surrogate, which is also embodied, but the surrogate embodiment is in replacement of something else, while the embodiment of the avatar is the same thing, but in a different form. And compare both of these again with facsimile, which again is basically a copy. These are three very different terms, and yet we have the desire to apply these terms to, if not the exact same things, then at least to the same kind of things. The term avatar has also been used to mean more generally a manifestation, and I actually think that this is the usage of the term that is closest to, the, to its application to digitized manuscripts, although there is, a, there is another recent um, usage that is relevant, probably you were all thinking about this already. Avatar is a term to describe a character in a computer game or environment, a character that represents a person or player within that virtual environment, so that avatar represents me in the computer. I don't think it's used so much um, this way these days, maybe, um, but 10 years ago when Second Life uh, was really popular, Avatar was what we called um, the little people who went into a Second Life for us. There was also a movie. And there's also a cartoon. I didn't put the cartoon up, but there's lots of Avatar in sort of popular imagination. So what is an Avatar when it comes to medieval manuscripts? Eckerd uses the term to refer both to physical objects and to digital ones first describing the digital avatars of the Sherborne Missile included in the British Library exhibit, celebrating its purchase. These include large screen installations in the library gallery, a CD-ROM available for purchase, an online version, and a 3D animation sequence that plays as an introduction to the CD-ROM. However, as Eckerd says, quote, the avatars for these rare objects have been books themselves, ma manipulable, tangible, physical. The physicality of the book is part of its cultural role, whether as a public object or private delight. The digital facsimiles I have discussed here all attempt in one way or another to offer these medieval and early modern books to the fulfilling of both roles, and yet I would argue that they are ultimately stymied by the requirement to disembody the objects they display. The resulting tension between access and absence creates the ghosts that haunt the digital realm. I've always loved this uh, description of the tension of digitized manuscripts that she has here. And I'm tickled to notice only now, when I was working on this paper, that the term avatar is a, is a part of that sentence. And I know I keep quoting Endress, but I find here again that his thoughtfulness in exploring his terminology is really refreshing. And I wish more scholars did this kind of intellectual work. He says, quote, I find Siglione Tart's impulse to call digital versions avatars most consistent with my needs. The digital version as an incarnation, the physical object cross artifact crossing over and into a digital form. Since I am working on a gospel book, I cannot help but think about this issue's echo in early Christian prohibitions against depictions of Christ in the flesh. The prohibition motivated by the belief that physical matter is mundane, not divine, and therefore a painting or statue could not portray Christ's divine nature, thus could not portray Christ and was blasphemous. 
In a similar vein, without the blasphemy, a digital version cannot portray all of the versions of a physical artifact, but as mentioned, it also includes excesses. I appreciate Tart's choice of the word avatars, its recognition that digital artifacts have excesses and exist in a different reality and with different roles and potentials, offering unique advantages and experiences, a recognition that I want to carry forward in my sense of digital artifact or version. But later on, he goes to say he's not going to call them avatars because of the way the term avatar is used in computer games. So that's his, his reason for not, for not using it finally. So before I conclude, I would like to remark on our apparent desire as a community to apply meaning to digital versions of manuscripts by using existing terms rather than by inventing new terms. After all, we coin new words all the time. Just in this paper, I've mentioned snow clone and meme, both of which terms that were coined to describe things that already existed. So it would be understandable if we decided to make it a new term rather than reusing an old one. But as far as I know, we haven't. And if anyone has, it hasn't caught on enough to be reused widely in the scholarly community. I expect this comes from a desire to describe a new thing in terms that are understandable, as well as to define the new thing according to what came before. After all, as I just said, both snow clone and meme are terms for things that have existed long before there were words for them. While digital versions of manuscripts are new things that have a close relationship with things that existed before, so while we want to differentiate them, we also want to be able to acknowledge their similarities. And one way to do that is through the terms that we choose to call them. Although we use these three terms, facsimile, surrogate, and avatar, to refer to digitized manuscripts, it is clear that these terms don't mean the same thing. And that by choosing a specific term to refer to digitized manuscripts, we are drawing attention to particular aspects of them. If I call a digitized manuscript a facsimile, I draw attention to its status of a copy of a physical object. If I call it a surrogate, I draw attention to its status as a stand-in for the physical object. And if I call it an avatar, I draw attention to its status as a representation of the physical object in a digital world. Not a copy, not a replacement, but another version of that thing. Like pushing an idea through different memes, pushing the concept of a digitized manuscript through different terms gives us flexibility in how we consider them and how we explain them and our feelings about them to our audiences. That we can so easily apply terms with vastly different meanings to the digital versions of manuscripts says something about the complexity of these objects and their digital counterparts. Um, and before I open up for discussion, I do want to thank people who helped me with this paper. Um, Bridget Werty, Joanna Green, Carrie Thomas, and Anna Levine, who were all really helpful in talking me through this. Um, it made me nuts, um, and I could not have done it without them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. That was great. Um, do we have uh, questions? Yes, sir. We're being recorded. If you want to, do you want to be? Thanks, John. Hi. Hi. So, um, comment to question, okay. and that's it. It struck me as someone who comes from a printed book background and specifically a cataloging background mm. that um, as you were going through what an avatar, like the definitions of avatar, you lit upon manifestation, and that is a very potent word when we're considering the Ferber model oh, yes. and thinking of where manifestation, and I wonder if you could, if you uh, feel comfortable, if you could comment upon whether, uh, certainly not um, slavishly applying WEMI to manuscripts, but whether the um, creation of digital manuscripts allows the, um, a, manu the, the ma a line of manuscript um, ideation to be described in similar terms or like in terms that could be compared to um, printed books right. a little bit more easily. Okay, so Ferber um, is, what are the, it's work, work. expression, Manifestation and item, right? Right, work, expression, manifestation, and item. So 
That's a really great question. And I wish that I had thought about that before you asked it. Um, so I'm going to, so I'm going to respond. Um, I'm not exactly answering your question, but I will say something I, I had, um, I have a colleague here at Penn named Whitney Trotine, who is a sort of a book historian, and she does a lot of really interesting work, including digital books and things. And she was saying that um, she thinks, because one of the things that I do here at Penn is we, you know, we, we have our manuscripts, so we have the manuscripts on the shelf, and we digitize them. Um, so we send them to the lab, and we take these sort of very standard digital images, um, and then they're online. And then we sort of take them and sort of do other things with them. So I have this um, co project where I make collation models and sort of take the images and arrange them into the choir structures of books. Um, and so. And I also like to take videos. I take videos of books. It's like another thing. So that's these things. And she described that as a, um, uh, and now I'm forgetting the word. Like when you when you you have the the uh, kaleidoscope. Yeah, she said it's like a kaleidoscope. So that's that's a little bit more loosey goosey than like the the very structured like here is what the work is and here is what that is it's more like here's a here's an object and here are a wide variety of sort of things and i think because i think it will always be be different from manuscripts because every i mean every printed book of course is special and wonderful but manuscripts are are sort of different animals like that, and so I think maybe that's a, a, another way of thinking about it. I don't know, does that sort of kind of address what you're getting at? Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna think about that some more though. All right, so you equated, I think, in a really interesting way, memes and the terms that we use to describe manuscripts. And at the end there, you asked, why are we not using new terms? And all I could think was, I don't make new memes. Yes. <laughs> and so what I'd like to ask you, and I know this would be a challenge for me, is whether or not you have an idea of a new term that you are wanting to coin or or something that, you know, because this is, I think, an area of invention that is it's difficult in addition to all of the other great points that you brought up. Yeah. No, I think I think that I I think I really understand why we why we use existing terms instead of making up our own ones because we have there's so much because we're we're not we're not actually inventing as I sort of said at the end, like we're not really inventing brand new things. We're just making newer things out of things that are already there. Um, and so I don't have, I think it would be really weird to invent a new term for you know, digitized manuscripts. And I don't think it would catch on because I think other people, you know, it's kind of more interesting to adopt existing terms and even ones obviously that mean like really different really different things that sort of bring out different aspects of what it is we're doing. Um, and I love your point about we don't invent new memes, although of course, I mean, kind of like they do like they come up, you know, like the, the you know, Black Panther came out and before that we didn't have that meme and now we do and I don't know, it's, so, it's just really weird to think about. I know it's cool. So your response to Patrick's question um, got me thinking about the role of human intervention and human interpretation in whatever we want to call the pictures of manuscripts we see on our screens. Mm -hmm. um, and to think about how the words that you talked about today, the terms you talked about today, don't necessarily highlight that. They kind of downplay it, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so I wonder if you've thought about what what else the terms we're using don't say about what we see on the screen. Mm -hmm. What they don't say, oh gosh. Very open-ended for you. That is a very open-ended question. I don't know. Um, I've, 
I've been sp spending so much time thinking about what they do say that I haven't thought about what they what they don't say. And I don't, you know, it's not just like the, hmm, that's really hard, tough. I don't know. Does anybody else want to try to answer that question? I don't know if I, Lynn has her, has her hand up. Yeah, I've been thinking about this, um, about, I mean, when, with relationship to these words, because one of the things that digital, whatever you call them, objects, facsimiles, surrogates, they both reveal and conceal mm -hmm. something about an object. Mm -hmm. And so they can reveal things that you can't see easily, but they also conceal aspects of the object. And so I was trying to think through how each of those would capture that aspect of the digital object, you know, that sense of actually giving us something we don't easily have otherwise because of us, you know, not being able to see things, all of that, which when we blow up images, we can read them in ways we couldn't or we can see things there, but also how they conceal physical aspects of the mm -hmm. object as well. So I was trying to think about how those three would act, actually capture that, and I didn't feel like any of them does that particularly well, so I was just, that was one aspect I would have mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, I, yeah, I'm thinking about the conce the concealing, yeah. and I don't know if there's I don't know if there's a word like if there's like one term for it. It's more like a under sort of an understanding, and I don't think a lot of people because it's because it's sort of concealed in a in a very quiet way. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know it. So last week, um, I was down in the lab, and um, the photographer, it was with a class, and the photographer pulled out a scroll. And when he unrolled it and sort of had it held, held down on the ends, if you were looking at the side, you could see that, that it was quite, there was a sort of bend in the scroll. So it was like, it, it was like maybe even a couple of, couple of inches in the middle off of the, thing, and, but his camera was directly overhead. And so he took the photo, and we all looked at the computer screen, and it looked flat, right? Every digital image that you see that's made in a library looks flat because that's how we take the photos, because I think that's how microfilm photos were taken you know we're just used to this sort of flat thing and it does and it does conceal and the and the it, you know and the, these terms particularly the, these terms aren't really they're not really talking about the physical object at all they're really concerned with the relationship that this digital thing has with this physical thing and the the fact that they're that they're different in really important ways and that you are like losing you know the physical thing. Like we talk about a we talk about a digital facsimile of a book as though it's not just pictures of the pages, which is what it is. And like a book is not just a bunch of pages, right? There's a lot more to it. Um, and I think maybe maybe that's what Avatar is trying to get to. But but even that, like it doesn't just calling it an avatar doesn't make it an avatar. It's still just a bunch of pictures of pages. Uh, you know, unless you're actually trying to trying to capture that somehow, but you're never going, I don't think, you're ever actually gonna be able to do that, so, yeah. yeah. Sort of in that same vein, I was thinking about, um, admittedly, I'm not as familiar with what all information gets put into the digitized manuscript, but thinking about the sort of, not so much newer, but at least more widespread technology that's coming about of like, DNA typing leather and stuff and all of that, I'm assuming if it's not already, it's gonna start to be added to these digital files and um, gathered together. And then I'm wondering what terms, what new terms you would add to sort of this grouping to add in that information because it's, if you have all that extra information that you wouldn't necessarily get directly from the book before, um, is that really just a copy or is that adding something, adding a new flavor that a new term would require and what new terms you might think to add? Yeah. Well, on one hand, doing something like that, it's just, it's just more metadata. You know, it's more, it's more metadata. It's, it's, you could say it's sort of on par with a collation formula, right? It's just a little harder to get 
than a collation formula is, uh, de I guess depending on how tightly bound your manuscript is. Um, but, you know, is it going to be, you know, that's sort of, so now we have DNA, we have in our record, we have like DNA, you know, analysis of what the animals are. Are we going to start calling it something different? There are still people who are just going to call it a facsimile. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. And one of the points that I made sort of at the end is I think, I don't think that the terms are referring to different things. Like I think if the thing changes, we're not going to suddenly necessarily all of us stop using the term. We use the terms to, to describe different aspects of it. So if I have a digitized manuscript that has, you know, full collagen analysis and DNA analysis and ink analysis, and what I'm interested in is the fact that it looks like the manuscript, I'm still going to call it a facsimile. Um, and it may, and, but it's got lots of metadata uh, attached to it. I don't, I don't know um, that there would necessarily be a new term that would come with it. I don't know. Do you want to try a question? I mean, I with a microphone. <laughs> well, I think that what's interesting about all three of these terms, and I do think that they're nuanced in very, in very interesting ways, and, and, and thank you for that, Doc, is that they all, they're all talking about the digital image in relation to the medieval manuscript. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, and I think that the digital image, there's something about the word avatar that I like because it gives a sense of agency, perhaps independently of the medieval manuscript, which I think is important. And I'd kind of like to push that point. Because as much as a digital image might conceal what's in a medieval manuscript in any number of ways, it is an incredibly faithful copy of what was written on the page. And if you wanted to, medieval manuscripts themselves are copies. They're nearly all copies. They're copies of other manuscripts. And if I wanted a faithful copy of the text of a medieval manuscript, I would far rather go to a medieval, a, a, a digital capture of a medieval manuscript than I would a medieval copy of a medieval manuscript. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? And I think that, and I think that given the extraordinary uh, power that a digital image has to travel across time and space, and given the fact that uh, scholarship around the world is in fact using digital images without reference to the originals all the time, and given the fact that so much scholarship, including crowdsourcing, is only possible by using the original, the digital image, not the manuscript. I think it's worth thinking about the, a term for a, for a digital manuscript that doesn't necessarily refer back to the original all the time. The original one. Yeah, I think, I think that you said something, and I think you meant to say something uh, different. Oh. You said that people. You said that people refer. People use digital images re without referring to the original, and I think what you meant is people refer to digital images without saying that they're using digital images. They say that they're looking at the manuscript. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But, that's. But, but they also don't. They also don't refer to the original. So, for example, we're crowdsourcing the fragments of the Cairo Genesis, mm -hmm. and. Um, 200,000 people around the world are helping us crowdsource fragments, the transcription of, of fragments of the Cairo Geniza. These people are never, ever going to look at a Cairo Geniza fragment. They are just going to look right. at digital images of it. Okay. Yeah. So when a scholar is using one of these words, do you feel that they're going to select a specific word in order to influence the emotional aesthetic experience that the viewer is going to have with the manuscript online? That's a good question. So I think the, um, the, the very first example that I, that I gave was Elaine Treharn referring, using the term simulacrum. And I think that having read like the entirety of her article, I think that she was trying to um, to produce sort of a negative connotation um, 
that and whether I mean whether or not she would intend that the next time that you look at a manuscript online for you to like feel that negativity I don't I don't know if, I don't know but you know I think that most like I don't know if everybody is really careful about the terms that they use like clearly some of them just sort of throw them out um Bill Endress is clearly like being very careful and thoughtful about the terms that he's using um I don't think he's he doesn't seem to be so concerned about how you feel, you the reader feel. I think he's trying to be very particular and precise in his own, um, in his own terminology. Um, but I think, you know, people, people use language to try to convince other people to feel particular ways. Um, and I, you know, I am sure that there are um, scholars who would select their language in such a way to, to do that. Yeah, they might not, it might not always be conscious, maybe, but I think so. So working with these digital manuscripts is somebody that will never probably see the originals. Um, the text, the, the um, transmission. Um, you can transmit the content. And that is happening almost 100% if you know the language and can um, um, study what is going on here. Mm -hmm. But you miss the materiality, the presence of the thing. So how can we as a community um, describe the presence of the thing so that somebody who is never going to be there mm -hmm. touching the thing gets a vision of what that interaction might be like. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's a, that's a really great point. I don't think that there is ever going to be a way to, to express in totality that I think even if you had you know, your headset and VR, I mean, that's still a very false, and I think that that is actually what bothers me the most about even thinking about things like that, because if it gives you the impression that you are actually physically interacting with the thing, it's a complete, it's completely false because you're, because you're not actually. So I think that's really problematic. I think the, the best way, and, and, you know, one of the things I think that going back to, um, Whitney Trittine's idea of the kaleidoscope. I think having a lot of different ways to sort of get different viewpoints. So, I mean, high resolution photographs are one way. They give you a very particular point of it, but maybe go beyond the lab, you know, the sort of controlled shots in the lab and take some different shots where you're looking at it from the side, take some shots where you have somebody holding it so you can sort of see what it looks like. Um, I mentioned that I do um, videos. I like doing these little videos because it does give you, it's still mediated, right, by me and, and by time, but you can see, oh, here's how it looks. You can hear the parchment moving, which is something I never even thought about the, how parchment sounds until I started making videos. And I was like, oh, they're really loud because there's this parchment moving around, you know. Um, and so things, just thinking about different, you know, lots of different ways to approach it. And just, I think, accepting that there will always be something about it that will be a mystery unless you're, you're with it. Um, I think that acceptance is really important while still sort of pushing, pushing the boundary too. Thanks, Dart, that was fascinating. I, one thing that struck me about these three words is part of what they're not capturing in your own work. In other words, that a lot of what your own work has been about is gatherings and showing how gatherings work. Mm -hmm. And there, one of the interesting things is that in a way it's can only really be shown very often digitally unless the book is fairly damaged. In other words, that one of the reasons we collect damaged books is with broken bindings, is broken bindings are actually much better when the back's peeled off or something. You can show the gatherings. And actually good, you know, high quality books 
are fairly useless for that because they conceal the gatherings. That's part of. Uh, so there, it's actually the object that conceals, mm -hmm. and it's the digital image that, particularly, what increasingly happens with medieval manuscripts is people actually show visually the gatherings. They don't describe it. It's not like a signature, an abstract system. And it does seem to me there that that that's is a very interesting area that's going to be much more useful in the future, is to try to get rid of these hopelessly complicated signature systems that we use in bibliography. You know, A8 to C8, we you know, we, we do this all the time. And it's a shorthand, but actually it's much better in my view to do the kind of thing you're doing, which actually to visualize that this is a gathering, you know, and at the same time, you can show what the animal skins are, mm -hmm. which again, you're not going to get, but most of us can't get that by looking at the original. We actually do need to do DNA analysis, as we now know, uh, that people have been wrong, systematically wrong, in fact, in identifying uh, parchments and what the animals are until we've done the DNA analysis. But this you can do in very, very useful shorthand systems, but it's not the same as any of these things. It's not facsimile, it's not surrogate, it's not avatar. It's actually something quite else that you only can do through the digital you know and that your own work illuminates to me a way of thinking about a book that is on the one hand rather abstract so it's more abstract than any one of these three things and yet at the same time is in some ways an understanding of the object that you never got in the original system by doing the signatures you know there's no way in which a8 to c8 gives you that actual grasp of how the the actual folders and singletons the way in which singletons are bound in and of course famously um for books printed books signatures never included engravings because engravings weren't considered to be part of the actual process so a signature you know most signatures don't include engravings uh, so you've got an again it, it not, doesn't actually correspond to any object at all is another way of putting it whereas your visualizations can mm -hmm. So Peter is making reference to a project that I have ongoing called VizCall, in, in which we create models, data models of the construction of manuscripts, choirs and leaves, and then visualize that in particular ways. So you can actually generate a formula that you could put in a record, but you can also generate um, diagrams, or if you have digitized images, you can pull in and build um, bifolia, um, Hopefully, uh, soon we'll be able to do full sheet, like printed sheets. So, um, so I guess that to go back to you to your question earlier about how we get the point, the you know, you lose when you take just photos. We take photos and you lose this, but then there's all of this information about the the physical object that can be viewed in in, in different ways. And it also um, gets to Devin's question about uh, you know analysis too so maybe in the future the best way to you know get the the idea of the physical object is not to look at pictures of it or not only to look at pictures of it but to analyze all of this data and visualize it in, in new and interesting ways If I may, I think I think that um, coming around the corner very soon is um, really good OCR of manuscripts, and and I think it's going to be I think I think we're going to have on the web we're going to have OCR text made out of digital images that couldn't be made out of medieval manuscripts. Uh, so actually, actually, the, a machine is going to create an OCR text that's going to be from a digital image and not from a manuscript. Um, and, and in that sense, the digital image, rather as Peter was saying in terms of the construction, the digital image is going to enable uh, the creation of text and the manipulation of text in a way that, in a way that the original manuscript couldn't. I will believe it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it remains for us to thank Dot very much, and I think we've got drinks, right, Devon? Fantastic. Thank you.